The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and DeKalb, Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta. Hi, I'm Bernard Tobin. Welcome to Ontario Diagnostic Days, episode number four. Today we're going to talk about some agronomy hot topics for corn and soybean growers. We'll kick it off with Omafra soybean specialist Horst Bonner and pioneer agronomist Greg Stops. They'll look back at the dry planting conditions of spring 2021 and tackle the question, how deep should you plant your soybeans? From there, we'll travel with University of Guelph weed scientist Dr. Peter Sikama through his research plots. He'll share his best options for controlling glyphosate-resistant Canada fleabane. We'll then travel to Alora, Ontario, where Horace Bonner is joined by Aaron Stefanis from the Mosaic Company and NK Seeds agronomist Matt Rundle. They'll dig into soybean nodulation, nitrogen rates, and what combination offers the best return for growers. Omafra weed specialist Mike Cobra is up next as he looks at what causes corn bleaching injury and how to avoid it. University of Guelph associate professor Dave Hooker will then join Horse Bonner. They'll wrap up the day discussing whether growers should plant soybeans before corn. Again, CEU credits are available for Ontario Diagnostic Days. Look for the URL where you can apply for your credits. You will see that on the screen at various times throughout the episode. We also want to give you an opportunity to engage with our experts. We provided their contact information at the end of the episode. We also encourage you to put your questions in the YouTube comment section as you're watching the video. Here's episode number four. Welcome, it's Horst Bonner, and it's my pleasure again to have Greg Stops here, another diagnostic day session. We've pulled out the planter, and Greg, we're going to think a little bit again about planting depth. You know, I hit on this pretty hard last year, and we said an inch and a half is the general recommendation if someone just asks you and you don't have any other information. And we proved that last year, we had some real nice data, and then this year, totally different conditions right dry 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 and so we've got some some uh different things to look at here this year greg when someone asks you what is the right planning depth where do you take the conversation well i am right with you horst in that if you don't give me any other information and you say i'm planting soybeans what depth do i plant them at i say one and a half that's without a doubt hmm. kind of where i target Right. Now, from there, as a good agronomist, I'm going to ask you a pile of follow-up questions, right? So, what is your soil type? You know, what kind of moisture is in the soil today? What's your planting date? You know, those kinds of things have a big factor in my mind of where you go from that one and a half. If one and a half is my starting point, am I going a little shallower depending on some of those factors, or am I going a little deeper? And then it's the question of if I'm going deeper to get to moisture, which is probably mm -hmm. more important than depth, right. how deep can I go? And these are questions that I think we're exploring this year in a really dry year. Yeah, no, absolutely, right? And so when you think about depth and that little seed, we're quite comfortable. And, and again, last year we showed it two inches, no problem. And we hit on that many times that you got to be into depth, maybe as much as half, half an inch, or it dries out, right? right. And so uh, two and a half, I'm still okay. I, sometimes the plant stand isn't the 100% anymore, but I'd rather have that than dry soil. Okay, but now 
three is that okay three and a half you know and, and where where does it stop i'll tell you my comfort zone stops at two and a half inches what do yeah. you think i i think i'm right there with you um yeah. i i think you know we we've looked today um at a handful of flots we've got here that are one one and a half two two and a half and we see that progression right, as we go right. through it right where one's okay it was maybe a little dry and didn't fully imbibe right so there's a yeah. few plants missing one and a half is looking really good two here is looking almost perfect and two and a half starts to look a little less good right, again right? right a few of those are just not pushing up right so you've reached that kind of barrier there at two and a half and and both you and i start to get a little bit more uncomfortable in the right soil type, lighter soils, for sure, you can still get push from most soybean varieties, maybe not all edible varieties, uh, from three inches. But it gets a little bit more touch and go and be yeah. a little bit beyond my comfort range, right? So it, it comes, it, the big question for me is, where's your moisture at? Yes, right? yes. So, and, and if my moisture is barely at two and a half, is it worth trying to go to three? I, yeah, I don't yeah, think yeah. so. It, you might be better planting shallow, dry, and hoping for a rain, for or rain. just holding off planting till the forecast has a bit more guaranteed chance of rain or until after a rain, right? And, and certainly temperature has quite an impact, right? If it's 25 or 28 degrees, beans have such an incredible push. Yes. I'm much more comfortable. And that's one of the issues when you get into April planting, I actually feel more comfortable going shallow, Little looking shower. for yeah. heat right yeah, heat and, and dry heat. soil too yeah. uh, because it's so wet underneath yeah. so play, now, playing that game in april is a little bit different too absolutely. though because if you're looking for heat to get those beans up and running faster you got to think about where your frost free date is as well and we saw right. more than enough frost early into may this year that if those beans are up they're susceptible to a bit of damage right yeah yeah fair enough Okay, so now I'm in the field. Um, I want to measure, let's say I'm aiming for an inch and a half. How do you accurately measure where your seed is? Because sometimes there's a bit of a ridge, right? Especially yeah. with my planter, if I'm running the coulters up front because I've got corn residue. You know, how do you do it, Greg, when, you, when you're measuring it, the depth? Yeah, it can be really difficult to measure that depth. Like you say, different setups, different planters, uh, different um, different... Uh, approaches to cultivation in the right. field, right? Yep. Different soil types can create kind of a, um, a light fluffy soil that yep. packs down yep. a little differently. Where yep. do you measure from? And so what I like to do when I'm measuring seed depth, whether it's beans or corn, I like to try to make sure I level off a little piece above the trench, make sure that like I know that's the true ground level. It's not just fluffed up. You know, I pat my hand down on it a little bit. Yeah. Sometimes I'll use my hand or a stake or maybe even a screwdriver or something, whatever's yeah. flat to kind of just lay it across the top of the trench. And then I usually pull out a little seed digger, but you know, these things are hard to find when you really want them. So sometimes <laughs> you just use your finger, right? And and I go against that flat edge sitting along the top of the row, right? Knowing that that's kind of my soil surface. And I sink the measure measuring tool or my finger down to the top of the seed. And I kind of yeah, go yeah. from there to, to determine depth, right? Now, um, now you hit on something there and, and, and it sounds like we're getting maybe a bit too academic, but some people say you got to go to the bottom of the trench. Some people say middle of the seat. I know it's, yeah. it, we're, we're, we're splitting hairs here, but um, it, it, are you comfortable with the top of the seat? Because if you asked me, I'd say, you know, probably a bit deeper than that. Yeah, I, I think I'm usually comfortable with the top of the seed. Okay. I, I, there's other things I'm looking for at the same time, though, okay. right? Where okay. I'm looking to make sure that seed is nicely pressed into the bottom of the trench. Fair Good yeah. seed to soil contact, right? If that seed is pressed in there nicely, you know, whether I'm measuring from the exact middle of the seed or the top of the seed, it's going to be a few millimeters difference. But, you know, I'll be able to visually tell, is it at roughly one and a half or is it at one? That's a big difference, right? the few millimeters yeah, top yeah. to middle not a big deal 
Yeah, yeah, fair enough. So sometimes I get the question later on in the season, you know, my beans didn't come up properly. Um, I thought I was planting at two inches, but it seems like they're in deeper, right? And you know how this equipment is and soil, soil has so much to do with it, how fluffy it is. Um, is there a way with soybeans to determine from the root structure, similar to corn, after it's emerged, how deep you planted it? I I really wish there was. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah me too. But, but yeah, the reality yeah, is yeah. there isn't, no, right? There isn't, I, yeah. I think you can try here and there, right? Yeah, uh, you can try to pinch your finger at the soil surface, and if you can get the bean out without breaking all the roots, you can make an approximation, but it's really not reliable. I don't right, like right. doing it that way. Um, it's just not as easy to tell. If you catch it early enough and you can still find that seed coat down there, maybe. Um, if you catch it kind of while it's still germinating, before it has emerged, you can tell the depth. Yeah, yeah. But there really is no, no reliable way. way once it's emerged to tell what depth it was planted at. So the final thing we're going to do with the, this planter here is we're going to set each of these row units at a different depth going from Actually, we're just going to throw some seed on the surface for fun. Sounds crazy, but Greg, I think if it rains, some of those will leave. Some will come. of those will come. Yeah. yeah. So Absolutely. as deep as it'll go, which according to the setting would be four and a half inches, we'll see how deep we can actually get. And I think it's going to tell a really interesting story in terms of what you can get away with, with respect to planting depth. Now let's take a look at some of the plant stands we found. You can see that for the first planting date, it was too shallow to go one inch. And of course it was quite dry, so that makes sense. And it was also quite cool. So the two and a half inch beans uh, had a small reduction in plant stand over the one and a half and two inch. But then the May 18th, really only the two and a half inches showed a small reduction. And you can see a similar trend for the June 7th planting. Uh, but we had a rain soon after, so you can really tell that that one inch and one and a half inches uh, did quite well considering how shallow the one inch was. But there you go. If you get some rain, you can get away with that even. Here are the plant stand counts for those rows, two different varieties. And it just goes to show they do respond a little bit differently. Uh, but really at three inches, that's the obvious uh, break there, too deep for soybeans. And so that's why we say two and a half is about uh, as deep as we, uh, we feel comfortable with. Anyway, there you have it. We'll take those to yield and uh, it'll be really interesting to see if one and a half inches is the winner this year with it being so dry. Or maybe, maybe the two inch will be, uh, will be superior this year. Welcome to Diagnostic Days. My name's Peter Sikama. I'm with the University of Guelph Ridgetown campus, and I'm at one of our glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane sites. For those of you who are not familiar with glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane, it was first found in Ontario from seed collected in 2010 in Essex County. And over the next six growing seasons it is now found from Essex County adjacent to the US border to Glengarry County adjacent to the Quebec border. It is found in 30, at least 30 different counties within the province and 23 of those counties have both group two and group nine uh, resistant flea bean. In terms of a uh, flea bane, it can be a quite competitive uh, weed. In winter wheat, in our trials, the average yield loss was 11%. In uh, soybean, the average yield loss was 65%. And in corn, the average yield loss was 54%. Please keep in mind, though, that the yield loss is really correlated with both the time of flea bane emergence as well as the density of flea bane in each individual field. So uh, in terms of a flea bane, it grows as a summer annual or winter annual weed. The summer annual biotypes emerge anywhere between April and June, and the winter annuals come up sometime between August and October. 
and generally speaking, they're more competitive and result in a greater yield loss in uh, the crops that I mentioned. What I'll do today is I'll just show you, show you some of the new research that we're working on in terms of fleabane control in uh, soybean as well as corn and wheat. So uh, we've conducted about 10 years of research on glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane control in soybean. And in past research, the best foundation herbicide is Roundup plus Aragon plus Merge applied pre-plant. However, there are other options that also provide quite good control. A tank mix of Roundup plus Elevore, and then you add either Sencor or Aragon has provided good control. And uh, Roundup plus 240 plus either Sencor or Aragon has also provided good control. In this uh, research though, we're focusing on glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane control in E3 soybeans using a two pass program. So on my right hand side over here, there's the uh, control plot and you can see the density of Canada fleabane that this particular farmer has to deal with. And on my left hand side is Roundup plus Aragon applied uh, pre-emergence. And I think you'd agree with me that that is not commercially acceptable control. Now over here, what we've done is we've added a post-emergence uh, treatment. So we started with the same foundation herbicide. And so it was Roundup plus Aragon applied pre-plant. And then Liberty was applied post-emergence. And uh, you can see that this two-pass program of Roundup plus Aragon applied pre-plant followed by Liberty applied post-emergence has provided near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane in the, this trial. Another option that a grower that's growing E3 soybean has, he can put down his Roundup plus Aragon applied pre-plant, but then he can come back post-emergence with Enlist Dual. And that's exactly what we've done in this plot. And you'll see that there's near perfect control with this two-pass program of Roundup plus Aragon applied pre-plant followed by Enlist Duo applied post-emergence. So the objective of this research was to look at what herbicides can an Ontario farmer use applied pre-plant in corn for the control of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane. So in this experiment, these herbicides were applied prior to planting corn. Here you can see the density of the flea bane in the untreated control plot. And uh, right beside it in previous research, Integrity has always provided really good control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane pre-planting corn. And once again in this experiment, you can see near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane with integrity applied pre-plant. And in this uh, treatment over here, here's where Callisto plus atrazine was applied. And uh, Callisto plus atrazine, when you apply it pre-plant, the rate of Callisto goes up from 100 to 140 grams per hectare. And the rate of atrazine goes from 280 post-emergence to 1490 applied pre-plant. And the pre-plant uh, rate gives very good control of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane applied pre-plant in corn. Other options that are really effective for the control of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane applied pre-plant in corn include uh, products like Converge as well as Acuron. In this particular plot, we have Acuron Flexi, and make sure you take note of the weed escapes with Acuron Flexi. And so that's for farmers that do not like to use atrazine on their farm. In contrast to that, here you can see the difference between Acuron and Acuron Flexi. Here you can see where, where with the addition of atrazine, notice the improvement in the control of glyphosate resistant Canada fleabane in corn. 
So over here in this experiment, what we're looking at is which herbicides can a farmer apply post-emergence in corn to control emerged glyphosate-resistant Canada flea bane. A new herbicide that's available for Ontario farmers for managing weeds in corn as lotus from Bayer Crop Science. In this uh, particular plot, uh, Roundup plus lotus plus atrazine was applied post-emergence. And you can see near perfect control of the glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. So there are some areas in Canada where the uh, use of atrazine is restricted. And so in this uh, particular plot, it was similar to the previous one, but instead of tank mixing Roundup plus Lotus with atrazine, here it was Roundup plus Lotus plus uh, Bromoxynil or Pardner. And uh, both uh, atrazine and Pardner uh, increase reactive oxygen species in the plant. You get that same synergistic increase in control. And notice that you have near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane with Roundup plus Lotus plus Pardner in this plot. A treatment that's been really successful for us over the years in terms of managing glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane post-emergence in corn is Acuron applied post. And in this uh, particular plot, you can see near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane with Acuron applied post-emergence. So uh, similar to our work in soybean, the application of 2,4-D provides good, but not excellent control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane. Here you can notice that there are some flea bane escapes in corn with the post-emergence application of 2,4-D. So there's an old herbicide that's uh, being rejuvenated for use in corn, and that is uh, Lawn Trell from uh, Corteva. It's my understanding that the price has come down considerably in terms of Lawn Trell use. Lawn Trell is a very good post uh, glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane herbicide. And notice the excellent uh, control with Lawn Trell applied post emergence in this plot. And to wrap up our segment on glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane in corn, I'll show you a couple of uh, treatments from BASF. Two products that have worked really well for us are Dicamba applied post emergence as well as Marksman. And this happens to be a Marksman applied post emergence. And once again, notice the near perfect control of glyphosate resistant Canada flea bane post-emergence in corn with the application of Marksman. Okay, now we're going to talk about nitrogen in soybeans. We know that soybeans need a tremendous amount of nitrogen, so why not help them out by feeding a little bit of fertilizer? So I'm here with Aaron Stevanis, and we're going to talk about two aspects. One is early season nitrogen application, maybe to try and deal with some of that corn residue that is such a problem, especially in no-till. And then we're going to talk about mid-season application to really build uh, that big soybean crop when soybeans need the most nitrogen with Matt Rundell. He's an agronomist with NK for the second part. So Aaron, if a grower calls you up, he's a no-till grower, but he's not happy with early season growth on his soybeans. For years now, he's been observing this, and he says, well, Aaron, should I put on a small amount of nitrogen fertilizer to, to help those beans through that? What, what are your thoughts? That's a good question, and one, what I, I like that you teed into that also, you know, continually because the first mm. thing i would say is like how big is your corn crop because you're going to probably have a lot of residue but if right. it's a continual thing that means he's all that grower is always dealing with that residue penalty right. Right. we hear ken ferry talk about that carbon penalty by having too much residue i would say yeah let, let's talk about applying some early season nitrogen just to help break down those corn stalks because those microbes are taking the nitrogen from the soil to break down the corn stalk and robbing that early season mm. that we need yeah. now uh, I heard about some stuff in Quebec, uh, Horst. Uh, what are they doing over there? Well, I mean, there's there's growers that have tried 
uh, 28%, just 10 gallons of 28% right at seeding time, two inches over from the row. You don't want to be right on the row, obviously. And they've, they've had some pretty nice results. So actually, we're trying to replicate that here in Ontario. So in the plot where we're standing in, we've got that along with just straight urea, some ammonium sulfate to try and answer that sulfur question. But Aaron, here's my struggle with it. Uh, we've tried this before, putting on nitrogen early season for soybeans. And to be honest with you, I'm pretty discouraged with it. And you, you know where I'm, it's almost become a joke. You know where I'm going with this. It's one to two bushel yield response is the average, even in those fields with a lot of corn residue. So although I get the theory in practice, to be honest with you, ah, we're still really struggling to make that pay, yeah. right? And that's the key question. Okay, let's now dig some roots and decide whether this is good nodulation, bad nodulation. What, what am I looking for? If you look at this root here, you can see, so in general, when you think of how much, how much, uh, I mean, nodulations do we need uh, on, on a soybean root to essentially get that, the beginning, to get this thing, the nitrogen going, that, that symbiotic relationship. And really it's around that six to seven early on is what you need to right. kind of get it going. And as you can see here, this, this plant has great nodulation. Um, if we kind of even like maybe cut into that mm -hmm. nodule, mm -hmm. uh, we can see that we have that nice red pink color, which means it's alive and well. So really you can see here, we do have nitrogen on this plot, but it's not really inhibiting any of the nodulization on this plant. Um, yeah, yeah. What do you think, so, so, well, Well, I think you're right on. So in this plot, we put on 50 pounds of N, right? And I think that's the key question. How much can you get away with? A small amount, totally fine in terms of inhibiting nodulation. There's nothing to see here. They've, they've nodulated just as well, right? Yep. Uh, but certainly there's gotta be a break off somewhere. You know, if you're starting to talk about really feeding N, I'm comfortable with 50 pounds of N. After that, I start to get really nervous that we're actually doing maybe more harm than good. Okay, fine. What else inhibits nodulation? We've seen a lot of yellow fields this year and it's nitrogen deficiency, a lot of it. Yep, absolutely. And it's funny, cause you think about it, so we're talking about nodulation, but to tie it back to those corn stalks, you know, it takes essentially the microbes in the soil to be active. Right. And so what do we need in general for those processes? We need heat and moisture. Right. Um, we need heat and moisture to break down corn stalks, but we also need heat and moisture to get those rhizobia going actively, wanting to essentially uh, have that infect the root of the soybean and have that symbiotic relationship. Yeah, yeah. And, and what was this spring like? Dry, dry, dry. So, so often we've talked about Cool conditions inhibit nodulation, dry conditions yep. do it as well. And that's what we saw this year, right? So just give us one final thought on what other nutrients are important when it comes to nodulation and promoting it, promoting yep. nodulation. Absolutely. And so I kind of alluded to it in our other talk that we had when we were talking about soil, uh, the fertility in soybeans is that, so magnesium actually, uh, some work done by Dr. Chekmek out of the University of Sibanchi in, in uh, Turkey, he talks about how magnesium actually helps promote nodulation. And to not get too in depth in the science, some quick take home is essentially, magnesium helps in nutrient movement in the phloem. Okay. So it's taking essentially photosynthate out of the leaf, driving it down to the root. We have more sugars, we have more uh, um, mobile nutrient down to the to the root, so then we have more energy for that symbiotic relationship. So promote the idea is to promote more nodulation and healthier nodules as well. And, and we certainly also know that potassium is so important. Yep. If you have a K deficiency, you're 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 going to be in trouble when it comes to nodulating as well. Okay, let's leave it here. Uh, thanks, Aaron, and let's go and talk to Matt. Okay, now we're going to talk about mid-season nitrogen application. And Matt, we've had just an incredible season, so dry early on mm -hmm. and now wet. And I mean, the beans we're standing in here now, they're not bad, but they're not even either, eh? That's right. And you know, this is characteristic of a lot of the soybeans we're seeing in the province this year. You know, poor stands because of that early season drought conditions. Right. And now in some situations, we can't get the water to leave the field. And a lot of soybeans sitting in wet feet, uh, making, you know, making it a real struggle here this season, Horst. Yeah, absolutely. So the natural question is, if the beans are kind of yellow mm -hmm. and, you know, it's obviously nitrogen deficient, um, there is this question mid-season, 
Should we apply some nitrogen fertilizer to get beans through this kind of struggle? Um, as we're thinking about that, I think it's really important to know how much nitrogen a crop of soybeans actually needs. So how much does a crop of soybeans need? Yeah, well, Horst, that's a great question. That's the starting point to all these conversations, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, uh, a lot of people, you know, don't think of it this way, but actually soybeans need five pounds of nitrogen per bushel. You know, we think about our corn crop mm -hmm. around one pound per bushel, which we could argue all day what that number really right, is, right. but five pounds per bushel in soybeans, you know? And so we don't think about that much because of our good friend nodulation and, uh, and that, and that right. symbiotic relationship that the plant makes with rhizobium material uh, bacteria uh, in order to fixate nitrogen. So, you know, we can count on over half of our nitrogen coming from those nodules right. every season. Right. The rest of that nitrogen coming from the soil mineralization. Well, when we talk about the in-season nitrogen in, in a field, you know, like this, um, you know, these wet feet, a lot of times we just need to have patience right, because right. those nodules will continue to, uh, you know, to, to produce nitrogen we need. Yeah. And we start going down that road of feeding a crop with N, well, then we're down to feeding that entire crop. And so really that, that uh, you know, when we think about that narrative as far as what a 50 bushel crop would need, that's 250 pounds right, of N right, horse. Right, right, right. And I think that's the crux of the problem we just can't feed enough to make a significant difference. Yeah. And at the end of the day, really what it comes down to is the research that has been done shows clearly. Yeah. If you apply nitrogen during the season and uh, it, the season is halfway normal, mm -hmm. you're only going to gain maybe a bushel, maybe two, maybe nothing, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you yeah. apply a lot of nitrogen, hundreds of pounds, yeah. Obviously, you've got the real problem later on that you could have lodging, mm -hmm. or like this year with the kind of humid weather we've had, the last thing we want is more diseases, more, diseases, yep. more white mold. So that's the, yep. that's the problem of applying a lot of nitrogen, and a little bit of nitrogen doesn't do anything. Yep. It might green them up a little bit. Yep. So I'm in the camp, firmly in the ca camp, and I'm convinced that this is true. If we have patience, the beans will come out of it, and at the end of the day, you'll be further off just to leave them alone and not try and feed a significant amount of nitrogen at this stage. Now, okay, yeah. so the next question com comes up though, what about fields that had a complete nodulation failure? Yes. First time field, yeah. maybe even inoculated, still no nodules. What's our recommendation then? Because surely we need some nitrogen then. Yes, for sure, Horst. Well, you know, the OMAFRA, uh, the data that's been done shows that 50 pounds of actual N is actually a really good starting place for those fields. Am I right, Horst? Yeah, yeah, yeah 50. And I would say with today's prices, and it depends a little bit on the potential of that field, right? If it's a 35 bushel kind of field, 50's lots. Mm -hmm. But if it's 60, I, I, I'm okay with even going to 70 or 80, but mm -hmm. certainly not 200. Yeah. And, and the rest comes from exactly what you said. It comes the from the soil anyway. It comes yes. from the soil anyway. So yeah. we have to talk about form. Yeah. You're doing some really uh, interesting trials where actually we're pushing. Can we get 100 bushels? That's the goal, right, Matt? That's the, That's goal. the goal. That's the goal. And some of them look awesome, by yeah. the way. Some of them look really good this year with the moisture we've had. What kind of nitrogen are you putting on in those trials? Yeah, we're just going with a straight dry urea for the time of year that we're putting this okay. nitrogen down. Uh, we, we went one application at R1.5 and a second application at R3.5 of urea. We've treated that urea with a nitrogen stabilizer to protect against okay. volatilization okay. and uh, denitrification. But uh, you know, keeping it simple and having that nitrogen in a plant available form so it's, ready, it's readily available you know, as, soon, as, soon as, it, as soon as it's uptaken by the soil and into the roots. And of course, the theory is that once you push soybeans past a certain uh, yield potential, maybe 80 bushels, yeah. even natural end fixation isn't enough. And that's why yes. you're doing that, right? Exactly. That's the only situation why we're applying nitrogen on our soybeans is because of the high, high demand yeah. of a 100 bushel crop. You know, the amount, when we talked about earlier, the amount of uh, end fixation that occurs, well, you can only expect about 200 pounds of N provided by fixation. What happens after that point is uptake continues to climb as 
your, your yield increases, but that nodulation can't keep up. Right, so so right. the simple math horse of what, we're, what we decided to do on, with, with uh, these trials for 100 bushels, we can count on 200 pounds from fixation. Okay. We can count on 100 pounds of soil mineralization as rough guidelines, 5% organic matter and 20 pounds of N per percent organic matter in a season. So that's, that's another 100, so we're at 300. So we've actually applied 200 pounds mm. of, of nitrogen as urea in those two applications of N in, the, yeah, in these yeah. trials. So let's wrap it up, excellent discussion. Here's the problem with nitrogen on soybeans. Yes, we can get a couple bushels here or there, but it's almost never five or eight bushels. Yeah. So the economics just aren't there. Mm -hmm. Leave the beans alone. Leave the rest of this up to researchers like Matt and let's figure this out before we start applying nitrogen on a big scale. Yeah. Thank you. So this is textbook bleaching herbicide injury on corn. You'll notice the, the very white bleaching of the leaf tissue and surrounded by yellowing and then eventually that leaf tissue turns brown you'll notice that the new growth is good and there appears to be no plants that have uh, stunted so that's a good sign as well less impact if there's no stunting and not uh, injury on the new growth so my suspicion is that if we come back here and even I don't know, five days, that this injury will have subsided quite a bit. You'll also note on some of these plants, the remnants of some tissue damage from frost, from a lot of cool temperatures in the morning about a week ago. So yeah, we're seeing some bleaching injury here. We'll look throughout this field to see if we see any patterns. There's a couple of explanations for why you might see more bleaching injury in some fields. So let's go through that. Here's an area where we see a little bit more of the bleaching injury. It just happens when we step this off to be about the spot um, of the headlands where you're bound to see a little bit of overlap. And so uh, rate is a factor as to why you see herbicide injury, of course. And so, you know, assuming that the labeled rate went on this entire field, in areas like this, you might have uh, a slight overlap, so twice the labeled rate, and then naturally you're gonna see some injury as a result. When products are approved for use, they have to show acceptable crop safety and no yield loss at twice the labeled rate to you know, to deal with situations like this. So we clearly have an overlap here. The majority of the field though looks pretty good. Let's see if we can find other patterns. Here we don't see very much injury at all. And then there's just a section in here where there's more, and it's maybe tough to see in the camera. You can see the odd, it's easier with the naked eye. But I assure you, as we'll zoom up to some of these, you'll see random plants that are showing injury. So here's an example in here of a plant that has that bleaching injury and right beside it, a plant that is completely unaffected. And there again, you see a plant that's bleached. So all this to say is then you wanna look at varietal sensitivity or hybrid sensitivity. And does this hybrid have sensitivity to bleaching herbicides? Is this a hybrid that is, um, you know, refuge in a bag? So a portion of the seed is a different hybrid and is that hybrid sensitive? So those are things you rule out too. So one, you look at rate. Two, you look at stressful conditions. You know, is there frost? Is there compaction that might lead to additional injury? And then you look at variety as things to rule out. So let's contrast and compare injury symptoms. So here again, typical bleaching injury with the white tissue, yellow followed by brown. You'll notice that the new growth there is not affected and plant height is not affected, especially when we compare it to plants that have not been affected. So in these kind of cases, the injury is very cosmetic 
and will have almost no impact, if, if any, on yield. Another place to look at in terms of looking at different rates is like corners of the field where maybe if the sprayer takes the corner, you're more likely to see higher rates. In areas like this, where it's either had a higher rate, which is kind of what it looks like in this row, or a higher rate combined with stressful conditions, and you see the new growth is affected. Here we have, you know, kind of almost like a buggy whipping effect. Uh, it's, it's affecting the plant's ability to put out new growth. And it's stunted plants. Then naturally these are circumstances where yield will be affected. It's just a question of how much. But here there's evidence that this was quite a high rate uh, that went on in this particular area. And so here we are seven days later from where we last looked at this field and pretty much all the bleaching injury is gone at this point. See the odd leaf there, but most of this corn has rebounded uh, very nicely, has grown quite well. And the only really noticeable bleaching injury is uh, where there was clearly a fairly high rate, but this section of the field seven days ago, you know, had the odd plant along every row that had some bleaching injury. It is no longer visible. But you'll recall, uh, we did look at some plants last week where there was much more visual injury and a lot more stunting, right? Where the new growth was being affected like we see it here. And this is just a, a super high rate of product, clearly. Uh, magnified by some maybe other additional stresses. And so now we have stunting, especially when we compare it to the unaffected rows there. Now there's quite a difference there in terms of, of corn. And that's when herbicide injury starts to impact yield is when you see plants that are stunted, whereas otherwise the growth would be perfectly fine. So welcome back to Diagnostic Days. It's Horst Bonner here, soybean specialist with Omafra. And thanks to you, Dr. Dave, it's uh, always fun to work with you. And we have a beautiful plot, one of your plots here. And what we're trying to assess here is, does ultra early planting soybeans make sense? And should we even plant soybeans before corn? Because you and I have talked for years about planting early. I remember one of our first talks, Dave, almost 20 years ago, and yeah. one of our main points was there's a few extra bushels if you plant soybeans yeah. early. And then we did some experiments. How much yield is there for planting, I'm going to say early versus, you know, more traditional mid-May soybeans? Well, our data shows that we can get probably four bushel per acre Mm -hmm. yield if we planted early. So early, we're talking about the last week of April or even the first week of May, that would be an early planting date uh, for soybean compared to a more typical date. I remember when I was in college as a student, May 15th, they said, don't yeah. plant before oh, May yeah. 15th oh. or May 24th even. Right, right. And now planting dates have moved up much earlier compared to even even 20 years ago, Horst. And so as these planting dates are moving, we need to do the research to try to calibrate our current recommendations to current weather conditions, current climate effects. And this is where this planting date conversation, that's why it has surfaced again. So let's think for a minute about, about why early planting even works, right? Mm -hmm. You and I, we picked some plants from these three different dates. We've got 10 varieties planted on April 20th, May 18th, and then June 15th. And we counted nodes. And I think right. that's so much of the story there. Visually, obviously right here, there's a huge difference between these two planting dates. But yep. the first two planting dates, visually, they actually look very similar until you count mm. nodes. That's right. So what we did is we counted nodes on these June 15th beans, and of course there's only three there. Who knows what they'll yield it? I bet mm. you they'll still be good with the mm. year we've had. Mm. But they can't compare to a bean that was planted on May 18th. We counted nodes, 
and we got seven nodes, right? And that's pretty good for, mm -hmm. for, for just starting really well into flowering now. And then, of course, when you compare that to the April beans, nine nodes. Now, those mm. two nodes don't sound like a lot, but I bet you that's where a good chunk of that four bushels comes from. Yes. And the other part about it is, Dave, what about light quality? Mm -hmm. Light quality or even light intensity, both right? light intensity yes. and quality. Those beans were pulled from the plots behind us. We have two different planting dates behind us. Both of those canopies filled in very quickly, intercepting as much solar radiation as possible. And so that's where we get, you know, the solar radiation interception, photosynthesis, crop growth rates are at its maximum or should be close to its maximum by the time the soybeans flower. And so that's what really, that's where a lot of our yield comes from, is that quick capture of solar radiation. And then if we have a longer day bean, we can capture, we can have a longer duration of crop growth as well. And so we have a better or more, uh, we have a better quality light yes. towards harvest or towards maturity. Yeah. And so that's, I think that's where a lot of that extra yield comes from, especially, especially if we plant a later than usual soybean variety and we go early, ultra early with that variety. Yeah, and I think that's the key to this whole question, right? That's why we're trying uh, this again. We have a pretty good handle on planting date. What we don't have a good handle on is what maturity should we plant for what heat unit area. And that's why we have mm -hmm. these trials across the province. Right. I have a pretty good sense that we should be pushing for significantly longer day beans when planting in early or in April. Okay, yep. so variety, that's one thing right? So what else do we need to think about when it comes to making that uh, decision to plant soybeans ultra early? What about geography? Yeah, geography is hugely important, especially, mm -hmm. especially when we're struggling, like should we plant soybeans or should we plant corn? Like that, that is a big decision. Yeah. And it kind of goes against our conventional wisdom, you know, traditional wisdom that corn should be planted before soybeans. Corn, bushel per acre per day, like we've been told that for years and years, but we know as well that soybeans lose yield potential as well. As well. Yeah. And I know in our previous research, we've done quite a bit of research in planting date and corn. We know that corn yield starts losing yield um, very early. That plateau where the maximum corn yield is attained is very narrow. Um, in early growing season areas. And so in those areas, Horst, I would be planting corn first yeah. before soybeans because we know that that's an effect in the early growing season areas. Yeah, Dave, and I, I'm with you 100%. And the other thing that we really got to think about, even though they're both base 10 crops, and what I mean by that is that they don't really grow until it's uh, above 10 degrees Celsius. The issue is the seed physiologically is different. And if you think about putting soybean seed into wet, saturated soils and it's cold for a month after, right. that seed's gonna rot, right? Where corn, on the other hand, has a better chance of making it out of the ground. And so that's why for a lot of Ontario, I'm not on board today, at least, maybe I'll change my mind, in terms of planting soybeans before corn in every case. So the, one of the main reasons traditionally we haven't planted soybeans ultra early is just frost, right? And we did have some growers further north that need, and eastern Ontario that had to replant due to frost. So how do you, how do you bring that question into the decision making, Dave? Well, the frost is definitely a risk, a risk factor, and that, that keeps people out of the field or makes them want to plant corn before soybeans. Yeah, yeah. Soybeans, a growing point, is above the soil surface. As soon as a bean plant emerges, the growing point yeah. is above the soil surface, and that plant essentially is susceptible right. uh, to frost damage. And the risk of that happening, Horst, is much greater up north than sure it is, is in the southwest. Yeah. And we just want it, we need to mitigate those risk yeah. factors as much as possible. So Dave, do you see a day in the future where in the southwest here, we'll plant soybeans, all of soybeans before corn, and in the north, maybe it'll be the other way around? I don't know, to be honest with you. I could imagine it, 
We've done yeah. stranger things. Right, right. And the trends are changing. Yeah, yeah. And agronomy, as climate is changing, as we're figuring out how genetics interacts with yes. the environment and what management that we can do to maximize the yields with minimal, minimal expense input. Right. Um, these are some of the things that don't cost any money. We're deciding whether to plant early or a different maturity group soybean or different hybrid of corn. Those really don't cost anymore. Yes, right. It's not a different right. input. And so these are some of the decisions. This is how we can tweak our management in order to get the most economic yield out of our corn yeah. and soybean crops. One final thought for you. Surely if we're going to plant ultra early there's only one window often in april where it's fit and what i'm getting at is i think the field prep has to be done in the fall whatever that means for the grower but as what we're talking about is in april as soon as the ground is dry enough you don't have time to mess around with tillage mm -hmm. and all the rest of it it is time to plant maybe just one pass of tillage or something like that yeah that's right yeah. Anyway, Dave, this has been an excellent discussion, and I, and I can't wait to see the results. I think we're going to have some incredible data here, and let's see if it makes sense to plant soybeans before corn. Yeah. So there you have it. We hope you enjoyed episode number four of Ontario Diagnostic Days. We'll be back again on September 14th with a new episode. We'll be talking soil health, nutrient management, and water. We'll see you then. The Ontario Diagnostic Days on realagriculture.com is brought to you by the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs, the University of Guelph, Ontario Soil and Crop Improvement Association, Grain Farmers of Ontario, Agris Co-op, BSF Canada, Bear and Decal. Corteva and Pioneer, Great Lakes Grain, Mazex, The Mosaic Company, Pride Seeds, and Syngenta.